You know, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, Black History Month. And uh, it's funny because Black History Month is on February, it's in February. And, uh, but it's also celebrated many times in October, I'll be more real. But February, the United States and Canada usually celebrate Black History Month. But the uh, um, Great Britain, they celebrate it in October. But if you notice, a lot of times we all, all three of those countries end up celebrating it together anyway. You know what I mean? So, and so today, since, uh, since this is Black History Month, we wanted to go ahead and bring something to you. The name of the sermon today that I'll be bringing the message to you first is called Forged in the Heat of Oppression. All right. Forged in the Heat of Oppression. Focus statement is that the end of slavery marked the beginning of much greatness for the African American, for he was finally free to dream. And function statement is the African American dream is perpetualized when manifested in his creative ability. There's a lot of creative thought and imagination that even as I look out across this congregation is very strong. And so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we live in a time now where our imagination can be fruitful and can bring out a lot of great, wonderful ideas because there was a time when it was practically illegal for the African American to even think that much. Now, Oppression is a very, very serious thing that has been happening to mankind all down through history. In fact, you know that oppression was one of the main things that, uh, that the Jews went through when they were in Egypt. And if you recall, they were turned into slaves and they went through all that slavery and stuff. And then they, they cried out to God and they asked God to help them. Who did they cry out to? They cried out to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we have to understand something. When you cry out to God, that's the God that you want to cry out to. Don't be crying out to Buddha or somebody like that because you know what? They're still in their graves, okay? That's it. Jesus Christ, his grave is vacant. Empty, yes. Yeah, an empty grave. They got an empty tomb in there. So he proved to be. So anyway, we want to make sure that we. Uh, uh, that we pray to the same God that uh, Egypt, I mean, uh, that Israel prayed to at that time. So anyway, so God sent them who? Deliverer. He sent them who? Moses. And Moses led Israel out yes. from under the oppression that was going on in those days out of the slavery. Now that slavery and stuff, I mean, different oppression has been happening to us all the way down through history to different people. As we came on down, we had um, we had uh, uh, even in England, before the Americas were over here, the people were not free to worship the way that they wanted to. They wanted to be able to have freedom of religion, and they were not left free to be able to do that. So what did they do? They cried out to God. What did he do? Let me tell you something. God never does something in a small way. Yes. In 1492, you had Columbus come on across the water, ran into a, a, a country, a continent, and he said, oh my goodness, I had an accident. <laughs> and he pulled up, and, he, and America was born, 13 colonies, and they actually wrote a constitution saying that we have freedom of religion. A wonderful, wonderful thing. 13 colonies. But then, coming on now, we had even more oppression that happened, even within the Americas. In the early 1860s, war broke out between the nation, between the uh, uh, Confederates and the North, the North and the South, where they were fighting over slavery. Slavery stuck its ugly head into the history of the Americas and caused a major, major blight on the freedom that this country was supposed to stand for. And so the slaves, they poured out their hearts to God, once again the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they asked for, for that oppression to be lifted and that they would have some type of, uh, you know, relief from this issue. So what happened? The South lost that. And America began its long journey into where it is that we're at now. All of these things began to happen. That was in the early 1860s. Now, the, con the uh, uh, Constitution promised us certain legal promises, right? Certain legal things in the law. And but the thing was is that America needed to grow into that because even coming on down, we had issues with that because. 
the old Jim Crow laws came in and that even though the Constitution promised us one thing, America wasn't letting us out. And so there was a big issue with that. And so what happened? God's people cried out once again. And he all of a sudden, he said, Martin Luther King. He said John F. Kennedy and even Lyndon B. Johnson. And what happened? We had the Civil Rights Movement. And they signed in Civil Rights Law. Okay, that was supposed to promise to take care of everything that had been going on. So there's always these issues. God always answers the prayers of those people yes, who are being mistreated, who are being oppressed. When they cry out to him, he hears our prayers. Yes. Amen? Amen? Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Lamentations. 3, and we're going to read 56 through 59. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of God, please. Lamentations 3, 56 through 59. It's a little short passage. Yes. But we want to take it to heart. Give me an amen when you're ready. Amen. amen. Okay, Lamentations 3, 56 through 59. It says, You have heard my voice. Yes. Do not hide your ear from my prayer yeah. for relief, from my cry for help. You do near when I call on you. Yes. You said, do not fear. Oh Lord, you have pleaded my soul's cause, yes. and you have redeemed my life. Thank you, Lord. Oh Lord, you have seen my oppression. Yes. Judge my case. Let's be seated. Amen. Short and sweet, isn't it? Short and sweet. God hears us when we cry out to him. His people, when we cry out to him, his ear is attentive. He turns his ear to us. He wants to hear what we have to say. Do you know, never in history did the bondage of a people try to stifle the creative, innovative, and entrepreneurial spirit of such a people, where they were not allowed to express their God-given imagination that would permit the introduction and ultimate addition of technological advancement, cultural and richness and wealth, athletic contribution and prowess, as well as the wisdom derived from their ethnicity that enacted in the American flight of slavery. With the introduction of slavery to this country, Americans did not realize that they were hobbling the entire nation. Do you know what hobbling means? Have you, ever, have you ever watched, um, what was that movie, you know? I can't remember the movie, but it was called Hopping. They took, his, they took his feet and put him on a block and broke his ankle. So that he couldn't run away? That's it. <laughs> so they hobbled the nation by doing the things that they were doing. Handicapping it. And its ability to grow and mature into all that it could have been. Now, can you imagine what America might have been like? What it might have been if it hadn't gone down this particular road of perdition. Although this country may have turned out to be a lot better place for the African American, it was not going to be. In fact, our destiny was forever intertwined with the oppression that would become eternally owned by the African American and would forge him into the man that he is today. Now we have to ask ourselves a question. What kind of men are we? What kind of men and women are we today? That's a, a serious question. First of all, I'd like to say that all men at one time or another are confronted by terrible circumstances of oppression. What defines us is the way that we choose to respond to that oppression. Many people responded to the circumstances of oppression in the past with wars and unspeakable violence. But there were also many who responded with their intellect, became writers who painted pictures of their experiences in pen and paper. One such person was a lady named Harriet Ann Jacobs. Harriet was an African-American writer that escaped from slavery and became an abolitionist speaker and reformer. She wrote a single work entitled, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This was published in 1861. She wrote it under the pseudonym Melinda Brent. Now, it was one of the first autobiographical narratives about the struggle for freedom by female slaves and the sexual abuse that they endured. Yeah. 
After describing many of the horrors she endured, she writes about her escape to the north, which was in 1842, where she was taken in by anti-slavery people from the Philadelphia Vigilante Committee. Now they helped her get to New York, where she met a lady that suggested that she write her own life story. Now, can you see how some people choose to turn their bad circumstances into something good? Okay, we are the masters of what we choose to do with what happens to us. We don't have to live in a spirit of defeatedness. We can celebrate our triumph coming out of it all, still intact and able to document it. She went on to meet, and I know you recognize this name, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Okay, who wanted to use Jacob's experiences in her book, but that was just what prompted Jacob to write her own account. In the documentation of her own account, she says, and I quote, she says, I am aware that some of my adventures may seem incredible, but they are, nevertheless, strictly true. I have not exaggerated the wrongs inflicted by slavery. On the contrary, my descriptions fall far short of the facts that we do, the bad situations that come our way, it's up to us. It's up to us. I know myself personally, my wife tells me, she says, Tony, you should write your own story. Because I've had some crazy stuff happen to me, you know what I'm saying? I've had some crazy, my life has been crazy. <laughs> you understand me? I've had some crazy stuff. And I know, she says, you need to write this stuff down. And you know something, I think maybe one of these days I will. You know, but it's, it's interesting, we need to do this. Anyway, Harriet and Jacob, she experiences in her escaping slavery and her adventures in so doing have proved to be an inspirational thing to say the least and have even encouraged me to write my own autobiography. Just listening about her. I remember back in the, 90s, in the 1980s, I was given some time off. I was, I was working a job, I was living in Las Vegas. And I was working with a cable company, and I messed up, stepped out, like this up wrong. And you know how the big companies are. They put me in the office. Sit down, Tony. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, you messed up, bro. We're going to give you two weeks off with no pay. No pay? I guess I'm half a pay or something. No, I'm going to give you two weeks off. I said, OK. So I left, went home, you know, I walked in the house, lit the drag, walked up to my ex wife she was my wife at the time. I said, honey, I said, I got bad news. They, uh, they gave me two weeks off, no pay. I'm, I'm very upset. She looked at me and she taught me something. If there's anything I can say about my ex wife, she taught me this one lesson. She said, we need to take whatever bad thing has happened and turn it into something good. And I'm thinking, well, how do you do that in a situation like this? What could we turn into something good? And uh, give me time off, took my money. She says, well, you got two weeks off, let's go to Hawaii. I said, okay. She worked for Western Airlines, we went down, jumped on the plane, flew over the, over the sea, five hour flight. Not to mention it was first class. <laughs> went on over there, watched the movie, had a steak dinner, you know, while I was over there, going over there. We spent two weeks in Hawaii. I felt so good that the waves were crashing and the weather was beautiful. And I thought to myself, I need to share this with the audience. <laughs> so I went and got me some postcards. Send them to my job. Thank you guys for the time off. Yeah. Aloha. <laughs> Whatever it is that happens to us, we need to learn how to take it and turn it around. Amen? It doesn't have to be any other way. We can respond to adversity in any way that we wish. Let's not let adversity get to us in a negative way. Look at the situation, figure it out, and a way to turn it around. That's what God does all the time. I have seen him take X-rated movie theaters and turn them into churches. I have seen him take property that used to be used for meth labs, meth, meth uh, uh, there were meth labs, 
and he's turned them into places where we can go, rehab facilities. He's taken all those types of things to take. God will take from the enemy and he will give it to those who have been chosen to fulfill his will and to use it for his glory. There is no doubt that adversity and oppression is the mother of great individuals. Great individuals don't come out of things being so nice and sweet and easy. If things are going so nice and sweet and easy, you just cruise. You, know, you just cruise along. Man. But you know what? Great men come out, come out of a situation when they have proven to be who they are in the face of adversity and problems and trouble. Amen? Now, so far, I've chosen to use examples of people that are not very well known for their accomplishments. But I did that to show you that you don't have to fill enormous shoes in order to make a difference. All you have to do is choose to take the high road concerning your circumstances and turn them into something positive. Which brings me to an ex-slave named Susie King Taylor. Now, Miss Taylor was born Susie Ann Baker in 1848. Now, when she was about seven years old, her owner allowed her to move to Savannah to live with her grandmother. Although Georgia had strict laws against the formal education of blacks in the South, she attended two secret schools taught by black women. From them, she learned the rudiments of literacy and, uh, and then was helped by two white youths in extending her education. In 1862, she fled to St. Simon's Island that was occupied by the Union Army and proved to be a haven for escaped slaves. Within days of her arrival, her educational advantages came to the attention of the army officers who, who offered to obtain books. And if she would organize a school, thereby becoming the first black school teacher for free African American students to work in a freely operating freedmen's school in Georgia. Her first class taught 40 children in day school and a number of adults who came to her at night. And while teaching at the school in St. Simon's Island, she married a gentleman named Edward King, long lost grandfather of Martin Luther John Disney. <laughs> he was a non commissioned officer in the 33rd United States Colored Infantry Regiment. For three years, she moved around with her husband and brother's regiment, serving as a nurse in the laundry and teaching many of the black soldiers to read and write during their off hours. Now, what does that tell you about the gifts that God has given you? What does it tell you? Whatever God has given you, whatever your gift is, you can take it with you no matter where you go. It doesn't matter what it is that you do. God has given you a gift. No matter where you go, no matter what place you step into, that gift is yours and you can use it to glorify God. Amen? Amen. Listen, down here in Sierra I came out of these streets. I came out of these streets. I picked the baskets right outside, the one I used to use. <laughs> Pushing all my stuff around. But listen, God took me out of this. Cleaned me up. Straightened me out. Put me right back down here. And then he made me who it is that I am today. And listen, for everything that I do, everything that I do in my life that I live, I'm going to live to the glory of God. Everything. And I take, I take Jesus with me wherever I go. And so we need to understand that that's what all of us need to do. Now, although she had a great and wonderful ministry teaching people to read and write, I believe that we have today the greatest ministry in the world. And that is the sharing of the word of God with everyone that we can. And inviting them to salvation. Can there be anything more important than salvation? No. What good is anything else if we are not going to be there to enjoy it? To what purpose do we strive if all we are going to do is leave it behind to someone that has some work for it? If all we're doing is working for stuff that's going to blow in our own pockets, what good is that? Because if you ain't going to be around, the only thing he's going to be here, you can't take it with you. You're going to have to leave it to somebody. You know? You gotta leave it behind. That's why Ephesians 4, 11 and 13 says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, <coughs> some as pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints 
of the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand something. There's a lot of people that misunderstand what being a good Christian is about. A lot of people think that when you become a good Christian, what you're supposed to do is separate yourself from the rest of the world. That's not why you are here. If that's the case, when Jesus got here, what did he do? He went ahead and dinner with the prostitutes and the uh, tax collectors. Okay? Now, I'm not encouraging you, brothers, to go out and find a bunch of prostitutes to have dinner with. Okay? I'm talking about that. Uh, but what I am trying to tell you is that God wants you to mature. He wants to grow you up in Christ Jesus. He wants to make you strong where it doesn't matter where you go in this world, where you find yourself, you're not tempted by the things of this world. Okay? You're not tempted to do the things that this world is trying to tempt you to do. The sex, the drugs, the, the, the Cisco, all the stuff that you, that, that's trying to get you to do. What he wants you to be able to do is to be able to exist within this world, but not be of this world. Okay, that's why it's important, and, I, and I'm trying to teach people that freedom, that they have that freedom in Christ, that they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Just learn how to, to, to be strong enough where that stuff doesn't affect you anymore. Okay? It doesn't matter where I walk, up and down this street. I don't care what's going on. I walk right by guys if they're going like this. Counting them rocks. It don't make any difference to me. That's the last in the world that I am worried about. You know what I'm saying? We need to be able to live our lives. Amen? When you walk by it, just keep on just shining. Keep on going. Because it don't mean anything to you. So we can all contribute to this world something that God has gifted us with. In fact, that is our God-given responsibility. It is our responsibility for the pure reason that we are alive. To give back and contribute to the building up of everyone that we come into contact with, even if it's just a kind word. Why is that? Because some people will want to know where you got that joy. Some people want to know how it is that you feel that kind of joy, where you get it from, and how can they get it for themselves. And that gives us a chance to share Jesus with them, because Jesus is the only one that can give that kind of joy. It's a joy that deep down inside of us and it's not dependent on our surroundings and on the things that are happening around us. Let me tell you something. When you feel happy, happiness is not the same as having joy. Happiness, and that word is taken from happenings. Yeah. So it is derived, it comes from the things that are going on around you, things that make you happy. You got things going on around you that make you happy, that's a great thing. But that has nothing to do with joy because if good things are happening around you, you feel happiness. But as soon as those things turn around and bad things, you ain't feeling happy no more, are you? Okay, but the joy that Christ gives you stays with you forever. It stays with you. It's the joy that is down deep inside you. And it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Some of you know that I volunteer at the mission sometimes. And I used to get down here downtown in the 4 or 4.30 in the morning. I'd park right out here and I'd walk on down to the mission. So one morning about 4 30, I'm walking down the street. I'm filled with joy. I'm walking down the street filled with joy. I'm just feeling good. Feeling good, man, inside. And I'm watching this his brother that's standing over under the light post. He's got a blanket around him. It's cold at 4 30 in the morning. And he's looking at me like this. And I'm smiling, you know, and I'm walking down, I'm looking at him. I get right next to him and I said, how you doing, bro? It's good to see you, man. And he called me every name in the book. I looked up. He called me things I ain't even never heard before. I'm like, damn. But I was filled with joy. And so I walked right on by him. He didn't even affect me. Get my door. Walked on down the street. Went on to the mission. Had myself a wonderful time. But I'll tell you something, see. He didn't steal my joy. And I was trying to figure out, I said, now how can I reach this brother? I'm going to reach it somewhere. So one day, I'm walking down the street and I have to have some, 
some candy in my pocket. So I'm walking down the street, and he's there again. He looked at me, and I'm looking at him. So we're looking at each other. I get to him, and he was waiting for me to say something, but I reached out and pulled out a butter finger. He went, he grabbed it, and I said, that was a good thing. He didn't have nothing to say. He took that butter finger, and everything was fine. Sometimes you got to learn how to reach out in the name of Jesus in another way, you know what I mean? He obviously was not receiving my words, but he received my butter fingers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, what, that's the way the best things work. So now, like I said, it's true that some people just don't know how to receive stuff, but we have to figure out a way to be able to do it. So I was able to continue on down the road with my joy fully intact, because I was not dependent on that person's response to my greeting. Besides all that, he never realized that I was going to use that instance in the sermon right now that they did. But he didn't know he's the star right now. So when you're walking down, when you leave here today, you walk down there and somebody cusses you out, you say, you know, that's Tony was talking about. It. Now in conclusion, I wanted to wait to like the determination and the sacrifice of the first black troops that were allowed to enroll as free slaves in the United States military. During the war, the Civil War, there was nearly 200,000 blacks, most of them ex-slaves, who joined the Union Army. As righteous as the fight was, I don't believe that there was anybody more motivated than ex-slaves that had been liberated and finally had the chance to express their righteous indignation against those that would love to continue putting the African American in chains, that would love to continue uh, breaking up families by selling off their children, or by continuing the sexual abuse of, of a slave's wife just because she was their so-called property. Their contribution gave the North additional manpower that was extremely significant to the winning of the war. The United States Colored Troops, as they were called, or the USCT, were regiments of the United States Army consisting of nothing but African-American troops. The men of the 175th Regiment of the USCT made up approximately one-tenth of the Union Army. Now, although they fought in all theaters of the war, they were mainly used to protect the garrisons located in the back room in the uh, rear areas. This assignment led to the belief that the black soldiers were inferior when it came to leading the fight, and that they would only fight behind barricades. But during the most famous USCT action that took place at the Battle of the Crater during the Siege of Petersburg, residents of the USCT suffered heavy casualties when attempting to break through Confederate lines, thereby establishing themselves as formidable as any other American troop. In fact, as, they, as the battles raged on, it became more and more known that black soldiers captured in battle suffered extra violence at the hands of the Confederate soldiers. They were victims of battlefield massacres and atrocities. They were at risk from murder by Confederate soldiers rather than being held as prisoners of war. In fact, the prisoner of war exchange protocol fell apart over the Confederacy's position on black prisoners of war. Confederate law stating that blacks captured in uniform be tried as slave insurrectionists in civil courts, a capital offense with an automatic sentence of death. The USCT soldiers were often murdered even before they were taken to court. This Confederate policy made it extremely difficult um, to get um, for prisoner exchange. But as you can see, this didn't stop the black soldiers from fighting heroically in battle. A Lieutenant Colonel O.T. Beard stated that, and I quote, he says, on the last expedition, the fact was developed that colored men would fight in, would, would only fight behind barricades. But this time, they have proved by their heroism that they would fight even in open field. The price that black soldiers paid for fighting on the side of justice in the Civil War was extremely taxing. But they didn't seem to bother them. In fact, last that were liberated in the war, according to 
according to the tender of the beard said, and I quote, the color didn't flock with astonishing coolness and bravery for alacrity in offering, I'm sorry, in effecting landing, for determination and for bush fighting. I found them all I could desire, more than I had hoped for. They, they behaved bravely, gloriously, and deserved all praise. I started at St. Simon's with 62 colored fighting men and returned to Beaufort with 156 fighting men, all colored. As soon as we took a slave from his claimant, we placed a musket in his hand and he began to fight for the freedom of others. So there was no lack of bravery in the USCT. When someone is fighting for something that they are completely consumed with, when they are completely sold out for, it is not hard to give your life for that belief. The way that these soldiers were willing to give their lives for what they believed in is the same way that you and I should be willing to give our lives to Christ. Maybe we're not in a war here in the United States at this time that can take our lives. But there are countries right now that are taking the lives of fellow Christians because of the faith that they have in Christ. Did you know that over there in the Middle East, if you're a Muslim and you get you come over to Christ, that that's a death sentence. They want to kill you because you're leaving the Muslim faith and you're becoming a Christian. Their faith in Christ motivates them to bring the gospel to as many as they can, sharing the hope that they have for salvation. Although there are many heroes and examples of our black heritage that have made huge differences in our country and have made many of the present freedoms possible, it is important for us to understand that the battle is not over. Our black heritage is overflowing with creative, innovative, an imagination that can continue to add to this great nation as we use our commitment to follow Christ and to serve one another. Therefore, as we celebrate Black History Month, with our commitment to Christ combined with our Black heritage, let us remember the words of one of our greatest leaders, Martin Luther King Jr., who said, and I quote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy.